A South Africa train crash leaves 18 people dead and hundreds injured. What surprises African immigrants most about life in the U.S.? And an Egyptian player is named African Footballer of the Year for 2017. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. We begin this evening in South Africa where a passenger train packed with hundreds of travelers returning home after the holidays burst into flames after striking a truck at a crossing in rural part of the country. At least 18 people were killed and some 260 others were injured. A radio official says the truck was attempting to outrun the train before it reached a crossing on Thursday when the collision occurred. This unfortunate incident, uh, what happened here today is that a truck driver failed to observe the rules of a level crossing. He was driving a huge truck and towing another truck behind him, another trailer behind him. And therefore he was racing, wanting to beat the, the train at a level crossing. And this is what led to this tragedy. Well, a government official agreed that the truck driver was attempting to beat the train to the crossing, but local police are still investigating the cause. The train was traveling from Port Elizabeth to the country's commercial hub, Johannesburg. Several passengers were trapped inside the burning cars, while others managed to escape the flames and smoke. Now, clashes erupted near the South Sudanese capital, uh, Juba, overnight between government troops and rebels. Uh, Ms. Spokesman Lul Rai Kuang says several people were killed after rebel uh, troops attempted to seize a military outpost west of Juba, held by Kiri Sudan People's Liberation Army. Kuang says the rebel fighters were under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Chan Garang, a high-ranking officer who defected from the government last year. Kuang did not give details on how many had died, but he says the fighting is ongoing. Now, Zimbabwe's President Emerson Munangagwa has ruled out forming a coalition government. The president made the remarks on Friday after visiting opposition leader Morgan Changrai. Zimbabwe is due to hold elections in 2018 in the first big test of Munangagwa's legitimacy after he rose to power in last, last November following a de facto military coup which saw long-time leader Robert Mugabe reluctantly resign. Munangagwa's ZANU-PF party at the MDC were partners in a government of national unity for five years until 2013, eventually breaking down as acrimony between the parties re-emerged. Changrai, who is due to challenge Mnangagwa in national elections, has been receiving treatment for colon cancer since 2016, but he says he's in good health. Now, the United Nations mission in the Central African Republic is condemning the violence that has resulted in loss of life and population displacement in the north and west of the country. Meanwhile, the UN Secretary General's Special Representative Francois lanceny Fall intends to visit Equatorial Guinea next week to meet with the authorities following reports of an attempted coup d'etat there on December the 28th. Uh, now, for more on, the situ on both situations, VOA's Margaret Bashir joins us live uh, from the United Nations in New York. Uh, Margaret, how are you? Hi, Vincent. Happy New Year. Uh, thank you. Now, let's begin with uh, the CLR. Uh, we have heard of this report. Tell us more about what the UN is specifically doing to help uh, at least prevent deaths of civilians there. Right, so the UN mission in CAR strongly condemning this New Year's Eve uh, violence that happened. Uh, they said that they sent reinforcements, they multiplied patrols in the town to kind of quell uh, the situation. They said as of the 1st of January, tensions had eased a bit. Uh, it was reportedly the revolution justice arm group that attacked Muslim neighborhoods there that caused uh, the surge in violence. And uh, you, you may recall that the UN Security Council extended the mandate of the UN peacekeepers in CAR for an extra year. Last year, the French Sangaris troops left CAR, and there has been this upsurge in violence since they left. Uh, but the UN has given 900 more troops to the MINUSCA mission there in order to try and help uh, calm the situation. So the UN very concerned today. The UN Refugee Agency said that 
5,000 uh, refugees have arrived in southern Chad from the Central African Republic since uh, late December, since this started. And uh, they said the, the number of refugees from CAR and Chad is around 75,000. Uh, they have a huge number there, and they're very concerned about the current displacement, uh, that uh, this could be a bad trend as we start 2018. Now, uh, Margaret, let's, let's just move on quickly to the uh, Equatoria Guinea situation there. We just heard that there was an attempted coup. What more? I know you questioned an official there. What more is known? Uh, well, the, the UN really doesn't know too much more, and that's why they're sending uh, the envoy, Mr. Fall. And, uh, you know, basically he hopes to find out some more information from the authorities there and to assess the situation on the ground. I mean, we've seen, uh, we've all seen the same reports, I guess, about uh, the, the um, Equatorial Guineans saying that uh, mercenaries came and tried to instigate this coup. So uh, maybe he can find out more on this. But in an interesting side note, Equatorial Guinea has just uh, joined the UN Security Council for a two-year term. It just began on January 1st. So we'll be seeing more of them uh, here at the UN. So perhaps an opportunity also to find out more about what may have happened in, in that country. So it's more just like going to find out what really happened. That's it. Uh, as, as of now, I, I think that it's primarily a uh, fact-finding and assessment mission. All right. We'll wait and find out what uh, they come up with, and then you'll tell us. Margaret, okay. thank you very Hope much so. for joining us on this frigid, miserable cold day in New York. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Vincent. Thank you. Uh, that is VOA's uh, Margaret Bashir reporting live from the United Nations. Now, Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari presided over an inauguration ceremony on Thursday in the northern Nigerian city of Kaduna to commission 10 Chinese built train carriages and two locomotive motives uh, for the Abuja Kaduna railway service. President Buhari boarded the train with other Nigerian officials for its trial run following the ceremony. As the first section of Nigeria's modernized railway network, the Kaduna Abuja Railway was built by the Chinese Civil Engineering Construction Corporation and put into use in July 2016. The railway so far has operated more than 500 days with the assistance of Chinese technicians transporting more than 50,000 commuters. While the United States is promising support for protesters in Iran, condemning Iranian officials for a crackdown that has left 21 people dead and more than 1,000 others under arrest. And now, a White House official says the U.S. will seek to impose new sanctions against those responsible for stifling protests that began just last week. And at the United Nations, U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley has requested an, an emergency U.N. meeting Friday to discuss the situation in Iran. The U.S. statement and sanctions are unlikely to sit well with Iranian officials, including Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who have blamed foreign governments uh, for instigating the protests. The protests over economic hardships and government corruption have been com uh, competing with pro-government rallies uh, the past two days. Now, the United States President Donald Trump is furious over a new book outlining a chaotic first year of his presidency. Fired employee Stephen Bannon, who ran President Trump's presidential campaign in its final quarter of 2016 and was chief strategist in the White House, is quoted extensively by author Michael Wolff in the 336-page book. In the most controversial passage in the book, Bannon is quoted saying the, he, thought it, uh, he thought it treasonous and unpatriotic that Trump's eldest son, Donald Trump Jr., along with the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, now a White House advisor, and then campaign manager Paul Manafort, uh, met with Russians in the midst of the campaign at the Trump Tower in New York. A lawyer for Trump on Thursday sought to block publication of the book, contending it is, def it is def uh, defamatory and libelous. However, the book was released overnight, early Friday morning. Trump's legal team also sent a cease and desist letter to Bannon, demanding that he stop making defamatory remarks about Trump and his family. We're well, staying in the U.S. Most of the U.S. eastern seaboard is in deep freeze that is not expected to ease until next week. A massive coastal storm called a bomb cyclone because of the sudden drop in pressure that brought hurricane-like conditions along the Atlantic coast Thursday and damped snow in southern states that rarely see it. Now, the winter storm also grounded thousands of flights and caused an Amtrak train derailment in Savannah, Georgia. Viewers, Ladita Hope reports. 
Visibility was low at Times Square in New York as crews struggled to clear surrounding streets. How is it, man? It is hard. It is hard, man. But we got to do it. We got to do what we got to do. But residents as well as visitors came out to brave the weather. I think it's a great novelty. I don't know if I'd like it, like, seasonally. I'm pretty comfortable with the warmth in Australia, but it's a good novelty. But when New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announced a state of emergency Thursday, he urged citizens to stay away from the roads, if at all possible. I've been uh, on most of the roads in the metropolitan area this morning, and I can tell you it is ugly and it is dangerous and it is slow. So uh, even though we are invincible New Yorkers, uh, a little caution uh, and if it's unnecessary to go out, uh, today is not the day to be driving around if you really, really don't have to be driving around. Icy weather caused an Amtrak train with nearly 300 passengers to derail at a station in Savannah, Georgia. There were no casualties on the train, which was en route from Miami to New York. But car accidents were frequent on the highways in the states that seldom see snow. People just don't have any experience driving in it. So, you know, we don't have a lot of trucks to salt and, and scrape just because we don't need it that often. So, it's, you know, it's a little more difficult. It's a little slower moving. Families who traveled to the south to get away from snow were in for a surprise. We thought we were coming down south and it was going to be nice and warm and we were leaving the snow and the cold weather in Chicago. And then there's snow and it's beautiful though. But local residents are not used to the cold and homeless people, even in Florida, had to look for shelters. Freezing cold. It's freezing cold. The Arctic freeze is expected to ease Monday. Zlatica Hoke, VOA News, Washington. Well, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we have. And join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCorry. Now coming up, Africans living in the U.S. share their most surprising culture shock moment. Stay with us. Migrating from one's native land to another country always comes with certain expectations. But few pay attention to the culture shock that truly awaits them in their newfound home. In part two of Culture Shock for Africans in America, my colleague Esther Gidoyuat talks to Africans right here at VOA. Let's find out what surprises our colleagues encountered when they first came to the U.S. But remember, not everything you wear looks stylish in a foreign country. Here's Modibo Dembele from Timbuktu, Mali. One day I went out and I was wearing a, a jean. You know, in Mali we like uh, wearing tight jean. And somebody saw me and the person thought I was, you know, from a gay. And I was really shocked. And another one was also, I asked them if they know about Timbuktu. And they say, oh yeah, it's so far like Timbuktu. And I say, do you know Timbuktu is located in Mali? And uh, they say, oh no, I never know that. I say, yes, Timbuktu is an ancient city in Mali located in the extreme north of Mali. Meet Fatuma Kalala from DRC. Someone called me. She was like, oh, my birthday is tonight. Can you bring me that vase that I saw at Macy's? I was like, okay. I went to Macy's. I got that, the thing, and I came with it with my receipt, like she's going to give me the money back because she ordered that thing. It's not that I intended to buy it, but she ordered me to buy that vest for her birthday. I didn't know that it was the culture. So when you are going for a birthday, someone can call you and tell you what she needs, so and so that. 
Sande Shomari from Tanzania likes America's burgers and French fries. I'm going to a Burger King. This is my favorite food place that I started to eat. I wanted, of course, French fries and uh, they give you ketchup. But what are you talking about when you say ketchup? You know that. In Africa, there's nothing called ketchup. I was talking about tomato sauce. Can I have some tomato sauce? <laughs> Somebody's telling me, tomato, what is that? <laughs> so... From Mali, being tall is not uncommon. Here's Shaq Tiro. Uh, I was in basketball team, and uh, people ask you a question, you know, how do you guys do in Africa? You know, I'm 6'10", a lot of people ask me, do, you, do all you guys this, this tall in Africa? I say, well, in Mali, the average height is 6'1 and taller, you know, and, and uh, people are curious. Tigist Geme is from Ethiopia and was shocked to hear her country is most remembered in America for a famine that devastated the East African nations decades ago. Georges Sagno from Guinea heard this from a fellow student. And one day in school, a lady told me, oh, I'm taking international travel. I said, where are you going? I went to California. I said, California is not international. We're talking about U.S. and you move from east to west. You say you are taking, you know, doing international travel. Orion Isis landed on American soil from Burundi and thought this is a magical country. Growing up, you hear a lot about America. It's all flowers. It's all white and beautiful. And, you know, it's a princess and prince life. And uh, when you arrive, um, right. depending on where you arrive, exactly which city, which state, which state, the perception is shocking. I was working in an ice cream shop, you know, trying to buy my... Um, the little things that I needed, and which I thought that you know, they would just come to me somehow, uh, my clothes, my shoes, my jewelry, everything would just somehow appear. Omari Kaseko from Tanzania wanted just a cup of coffee. You know, in Africa, you just go to buy coffee and you just get coffee. And there's all this uh, caramel, latte, coffee, mocha, and all this stuff. So I kept on looking and I'm saying, so what is this sort of stuff? Um, so I asked someone, I said, uh, I just want a coffee. It's, it's as simple as that. I said, oh, yeah, but you have all these coffee from different places, Colombia, and, you know. And, um, and that was shocking to me. For marvelous Nyahuye of Zimbabwe. What do you want Africans to know about America? What I would like um, those back home to know is that here there are opportunities. Anybody can make it. It doesn't matter where you start. There are people that came here, you know, doing housework at home, but now they're lawyers, they're doctors. So, you know, there is no measure of where you start. It's where you finish. Esther Gidu Ewart, VOA News, Washington. You know, a treasure, uh, a true treasure overlooks the city of Kinshasa on the top of uh, Ngaliema Hill, that's in the DRC. An exhibition room of a few dozen square meters is too small to contain the 45,000 pieces that have been collected from across the Democratic Republic of Congo. But this is the temp uh, temporary solution to keep some of this collection open to the public until a new and bigger museum opens in 2018. Abdurrahmani Dia tells us more. A true treasure overlooks the city of Kinshasa on top of Ngaliema Hill. An exhibition room of a few dozen square meters is too small to contain the 45,000 pieces that have been collected from across the Democratic Republic of Congo. But this is the temporary solution to keep some of this collection open to the public until a new and bigger museum opens in 2018. Director Joseph Ibongo says staff are working on a full inventory of the museum's holdings. This comes at the right time. We have to move the collections to the new museum in a year. Therefore, there are prerequisites before we can do that. VOA was given a guided tour of the reserve room for masks only open to the staff. Here, the creativity of the Congolese people is apparent. The mask in Africa hides something. You have to unveil it. It hides, and it's up to you to reveal it. Museum curator Henri Bagnata says Congolese masks preserve the influences and flavors of Congolese life. When the mask comes out, sometimes it represents an ancestor. Sometimes it's a woman, and women represent life. We learn a lot through the masks, even the gestures, the songs. 
All this relates to history. The Kinshasa Museum is also home to archaeological researchers. In this room, hundreds of pieces recovered from excavation sites are reviewed by scholars. Here, pieces of pottery from ancient Congolese populations, as well as pieces showing first contacts with colonizers. VOA toured the museum's collection of musical instruments for dozens of Congolese ethnic groups. Ibongo says drums used for festivals are often called on in solemn occasions as well. This is made of lizard skin, you see? Sometimes the sandbox is made of uh, pottery. It needs special care and a lot of delicacy when you use it. Once the new building opens, officials hope the Kinshasa Museum will be a center for the artistic and historical study of a country renowned for its cultural diversity from Africa's Great Lakes to the Atlantic. Abdurrahman Dja, VOA News, Kinshasa. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, an Egyptian footballer comes out on top. We'll be right back. South Africa, the death toll rises to 18, with 260 people injured after a passenger train burst into flames when it crashed into a truck. In Uganda, youth leaders for restoration and development formed by two former Lord's Resistance Army child soldiers to help victims of LRA violence compose songs and plays based on their experiences. In Liberia, former football star George Weah, officially certified by Election Commission as president, is to be sworn in in January 22nd. In Nigeria, President Muhammadu Buhari inaugurates 10 Chinese-built train carriages and two locomotives for the Abuja Kaduna Railway Service. Finally, Liverpool forward Mohamed Salah wins the African Footballer of the Year Award. Welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. Artificial intelligence is set to be a top trend at the annual consumer electronic show in Las Vegas. In Hong Kong, a startup is envisioning a future in which robots evolve to become super intelligent, genius machines that may help solve mankind's most challenging problems. Former sculptor at Walt Disney Imagineering, David Hanson is combining artificial intelligence with Southern China's expertise in toy design, electronics and manufacturing to craft humanoid social robots. They have, a, they have faces designed to be so uh, like, uh, lifelike and appealing that they can earn trust from humans who interact with them. Well, next up, uh, Melbourne's popular baby, uh, rather bayside beaches are about to become more accessible for people in wheelchairs. Uh, the local council is spending thousands of dollars on special free-to-use floating wheelchairs to allow more disabled people to enjoy the sun and surf. It is not all about the wheelchairs. It's also about safe study matting. This will help those who struggle to get through, uh, through the sand, uh, people on crutches or the elderly, for example, get to the water. Well, and finally, finally, a group of former child soldiers in Uganda is helping to heal the scars of a brutal rebellion by the Lord's Resistance Army. The Youth Leaders for Restoration and Development Groups was formed last year by two former child soldiers with support from the Chicago-based Golden Institute and the Tokyo-based Arigato International. It has brought together 240 people, more than half of them former LRA captives, to compose songs and, and plays based on their experiences. The rebel group, led by one of Africa's most wanted warlords, Joseph Kony, terrorized the region during the 1990s and early 2000s. And that's what is trending today. Now, Egyptian forward Mohamed Salah was named African Footballer of the Year for 2017 on Thursday. 
finishing ahead of his Liverpool teammate Sadio Mane of Senegal and Gabon striker Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. Salah 25 was presented with a trophy by the Confederation of African Football President Hamad at the International Conference Center in Accra, Ghana. Salah polled 625 points from a voting panel made up of national team coaches and captains, plus a selection of officials and journalists to win the award. Mane finished second with 507, with Aubame Nyang uh, third with 311. Al uh, Salah helped Egypt reach the African National Cup final and qualify for this year's World Cup. Now I want to close our show today with Yogi Bia. It's a new music video by the young Moroccan group Dara Tribes. It is traditional Shamra music of the Sahrawi people of southern Morocco. Until next time, from all of us here in Washington, have a good night. to English in a Minute. Woodwork is any part of a house or building that is made of wood. Crawl out of the woodwork. This expression sounds troubling. I won! I have the winning lottery ticket. Oh, that's great. How much money did you win? I won $25,000. But please, don't tell anyone. You're right.